Okay, so here we go. Um, hopefully you've done the readings. Hopefully you've watched the video. Um, even though it looks weird on Canvas, you can still get to it. It has something to do with monetizing. I think I explained that. I don't know what that means. But I want you to watch it anyway so you understand what's going on a little bit better today. Today, GeoShare X79, Marbury vs. Madison, and an overview of strict and loose construction. So let's get started. Um, Warm-up questions. Uh, the first three should look really familiar if you did your review sheet. Um, and the rest had to do with whether or not you did your homework or not. So if we were in class, we would have done the second like five questions um, about whether you did your homework. So just to get an idea, these need to be done, turned in. If you want to do them at the end of the tournament, do them at the end of the tournament. But make sure you guys turn them in so I can keep kind of grades going, making sure you guys are doing what you're supposed to do. So objective today, describe the importance of Marbury versus Madison and the Judiciary at 1789 with some notes. Entry card seven, you guys should have got that done or get it done. Main activity, Judiciary X1789, Marbury versus Madison 1803. And then homework is to get ready for the test. I'm sure, not sure what's just going on with that, but we just did get an email and a text saying, are we prepared to extend this? So I imagine tests will start coming down the pike soon, just so you guys are ready. Okay, so Marbury versus Madison. Um, it says that in this case that Mar Mar Marshall Wright, there's a lot of M's. Marshall writes in this case that it's emphatically the province and the duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. They get to say what words mean. They get to say what the Constitution means. If they say it, that's the law. And he says that. He says that for a reason. He wants to give the judiciary power. They can't enforce the law, no power of the sword. They can't make the law, no power of the purse. So they've got to have that ability to interpret. And Marshall's the one that writes at Marbury that they have that power. This is a monster deal. He basically gives them the power to check the other two branches by saying that because of Article 3 in the Constitution, they get to say what the law is. Now, quickly, before we start here, there's two things you have to understand, two terms. You might see these in the future, wink, not hint. First of all, a statute. A statute is a law created by a legislature. All right. So, for example, the Judiciary Act of 1789 was a law created by a legislature. <coughs> Excuse me. A precedent is a ruling made by the court for other courts to base their decisions on. The court that makes decisions is the Supreme Court. So if they make a decision, all lower courts, we'll get to that, make their decisions based off that court. So there's two terms you got to know, a statute and a precedent. The statute, Judiciary Act 1789, set up the idea of judicial review. The precedent set in Marbury v. Madison was the first time that judicial review was used. It's really important that you understand the difference, all right? Judicial review set up by the statute doesn't mean anything until Marshall uses it in Marbury versus Madison. Okay, let's get started. Judiciary Act of 1789, it did five things, all right? And it's important that you understand these fives. First thing that it did is it set up the number of justices on the Supreme Court. There was five associates and one chief. Now, here's the kicker with that. There's nothing in the Constitution about the number of Supreme Court justices there are. There's nothing in the Constitution about justices in general. You just have to get the idea that this Article 3 of the Constitution talks about a Supreme Court. So the first thing that had to be done was how many justices were there. Didn't say anything in the Constitution. Judiciary Act 1789, first thing that does that. All right, so now we got six. It actually, throughout history, we got six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. What you guys need to know is it set the number of justices or gave Congress the ability to do that. Second thing, it set up two other types of courts. All right, so we had a Supreme Court. We didn't know what it looked like, but we knew what it did. All right, and heard cases. We need other courts. So we have district courts and appellate courts. All right, here's the kicker. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction, the ability to hear a case the first time in two circumstances. One is when the United States is a party, meaning is the United States named in the case? If the United States is named, they're a party. It can't be someone working for the United States. It has to be the United States. So the Supreme Court can hear it for the first time if the United States is named or it's a controversy between two or more states. Check this out. Marbury or Madison, not the United States. Marbury or Madison, not a state. Now, there's two types of jurisdictions in all cases. First is original, the ability to hear a case for the first time. That's an original jurisdiction case. Okay. That means that the court can hear it for the first time if they're allowed. Appellate jurisdictions mean that 
the ability of a court to make a decision of whether or not the lower court made the right decision. They're not determining right or wrong, up or down. They're just determining whether or not the lower court made the right decision. I'll give you an example. I give you your grades. I'm the, I'm the original court, right? So you come to me and say, I got a problem with my grades. I say, tough. You go to Mr. True. Mr. True is the appellate court. He oversees my department. He's the guy that would determine whether or not I made the right decision. Now, he can't go back and change the grade, but he can tell me to change the grade. So I would be the original court and true would be the appellate court. All right. It's really important that you understand this unless it's one of these two circumstances. And I don't know if my cursor works on this, but unless it's one of these two circumstances, the United States Supreme Court is an appellate court at all times. We'll get to it. Third thing it did, it set up the procedure for judicial review. So the Judiciary Act of 1789, a statute, gave all courts in this country, federal courts in this country, the ability to use judicial review or the ability of a court to rule whether or not a legislative or executive act was constitutional or unconstitutional. This is their check and balance. But the procedure for it is set up by the Judiciary Act of 1789 doesn't mean anything until a court interprets it. So three things so far. One, number of justices. Two, appellate or original. Three, judicial review. Four, created a bridge from the state Supreme Court to the United States Supreme Court. This is huge down for Federalist 28. If you're looking down here, if you can see my cursor, if not, I'll get the two circles with a question mark. That question mark is Federalist 28. If it weren't for this part of the Judiciary Act of 1789, if a state violated your rights, you couldn't go to the national government. This is a monster, okay? This is a monster. This is a big deal. So if we didn't have this, there is no Brown v. Board of Education. There's nothing you could do if a state said, sorry, we're going to segregate. But because of this part of the Constitu of this act, okay, you can take your problems to the United States Supreme Court if a state denies your rights. Four things, let's review. One, number of justices. Two, circuit or district or original or appellate courts. District are original courts, appellate are appellate courts, Supreme Court are both courts. Supreme Court has both original and appellate jurisdiction. Three, judicial review. Four, procedure to get from a state court to a US Supreme Court. Number five, this gave the Supreme Court the ability to issue writs of mandamus. A writ is an order issued from a court telling an individual or a, or a government or anything to perform a certain act. Now, here's the kicker. Only original courts have the ability to issue writs. This means, because there's no specifics here, this means because they don't list when the Supreme Court can issue writs, they can now issue writs in all circumstances, which means that the Supreme Court was turned from an original court in only two circumstances to an original court in all circumstances, okay? So because this part of this act wasn't specific, it changed the jurisdiction of the court. Now here's the kicker. The jurisdiction of the court is written in the Constitution, as you guys can see in Article 3, Section 2, which means that this act changed the Constitution. Now, if I were in class, I'd have somebody raise their hand or I would call on somebody with a stick and say, can an act change the Constitution? Hopefully you would say no. So the kicker here is this act changed the Constitution and only an amendment can change the Constitution. And here lies the problem. Marbury sued Madison in the Supreme Court because of this section of this act, which turned the Supreme Court from an appellate court to an original court, and it shouldn't have. So, why did it happen? Basically, it happened because you watched the video. I hope you watched the video. If you didn't watch the video, go back and watch the video. It's because um, we had two different parties going on. Justices have life terms. Any judge has life terms. Adams was angry. He wanted to put all his judges into the courts to give Jefferson a really hard time when he became president. Madison doesn't deliver Marbury's uh, appointment. Marsh, and there's all these M's going on. So basically he sues, all right? Just make sure you guys understand that, right? The big deal here is that Adams was mad that he lost and he wanted to load 
the justices, all these courts with his appointees. So quickly, you have to understand here the difference between a strict construction and a loose construction before we get to the questions. Now, strict construction is someone that reads the Constitution literally. This guy up here at the top, if you can see the cursor, if not Clarence Thomas, he is a strict constructionist. If it doesn't say the national government can do it, he would say they can't. All right. If you can't read it, you can't do it. This is a huge deal. If you can't read it, you can't do it. So if it's not listed, it's not allowed. A loose constructionist, a loose constructionist would say, if it's not forbidden, you can do it. This guy down here, his name is Harry Blackman. Harry Blackman. Harry Blackman's the guy that wrote Roe v. Wade. Now you can hear somebody in the back room because my son opened the door. So if it's a little hard to hear, I, I apologize. So Harry Blackman would say, if it's not forbidden, you can do it. Clarence Thomas would say, if it's not written, you can't do it, right? So if it's not forbidden, you can do it. If it's not written, you can't do it. Let me give you an example. I go off to college, sophomore year, I switch schools, go off, go to see, go to my first swim meet, my mom is there, and I say, hey mom, I got a tattoo, not the one on my arm, I got another one on my ankle, right? So my mom was a strict constructionist. My mom says to me, I didn't say you could do that. She's a strict constructionist. She didn't say it. I couldn't do it. I was a loose constructionist, right? I responded, you didn't say I couldn't, right? That didn't go over well, but I was in college. So my mom was a strict constructionist. I didn't say you could, so you can't. I was a loose constructionist. You didn't say I couldn't, so I can. That's a big deal here. You got to understand the difference between strict and loose construction. Now, three questions you have to answer. And if you get these three questions, you understand Marbury. So, did Marbury have a right to the commission? Hopefully you looked up what the word remedy is, right? Because Marshall says, yes. He says, for any violation of a right, a corresponding remedy was part of it. And the reason he, he had the commission, or that's the second part, the reason he had the commission was the commission had been stamped by Marshall and signed by Adams. That means it was legitimate. So he deserved the commission. So second question, was he entitled to some remedy? And the answer to that question is yes. Marshall writes in Marbury versus Madison, for any violation of a right, a corresponding remedy for that violation must exist. In this case, that remedy would have been, would have been a order from the Supreme Court telling Madison to give the commission to Marbury. So at this point, at this point, Marbury is loving life. Does he have a right to the commission? Yes. Does he have a remedy? Yes. Last part, and notice when we started off earlier, that writ thing, all right. Was that remedy a writ from the Supreme Court? And in this instance, in this instance, Marshall says no. And the reason he says no is the fifth section of the Judiciary Act was unconstitutional. But now here's the problem. Here's the problem, all right? So I'm gonna go all the way back to here. Here we go. He says this is unconstitutional. But he's got a problem. If he declares the whole act unconstitutional, he loses this power. Or in other words, if he declares the entire Judiciary Act unconstitutional, he loses the power of judicial review. So here's what he does. He uses the third section to declare the fifth section unconstitutional and says, we never should have heard the case, right? He had to hear it because if one and two was no, he doesn't get to three. But because one and two is yes and he gets to three, he has to declare this unconstitutional with this. So in other words, he changes the law. He says that the Supreme Court has the ability to not only interpret the law, but change the law to make it legal. So the Judiciary Act of 1789 says the number of justices it says district and appellate, original and, and, and appellate jurisdiction. It says judicial review. It says creates a bridge. And this is gone. Does the Supreme Court still have the ability to issue writs? The answer, hopefully, you said is yes, but only in these two circumstances. So this is a big deal. This is a big deal. So if you understand this part, you are set. All right? Now, go take the quiz. You should... Ace it, have your notes on your desk, have the things you filled on your desk from your packet, 
have the readings on your desk, then take it again. There's no time limit. Get 100 and do a great job. And I'll see you tonight with tonight's video. Chill dog out.